Some years ago, I purchased a book. I don't know why. I was probably Smitty working on a series, working on a sermon. I can't remember what made me buy this book. It might have been recommended, Gwen, uh, to me by a friend of mine. But the book is um, by a gentleman by the name of Dr. Chris Thurman. And the title of the book is The Lies We Believe. And in this book, Dwight, Dr. Thurman examines the lies, the untruths that all of us believe. And even more important, how these lies, these untruths impact our lives. And in this book, Thurman shows that when we overcome these lies, when we overcome these untruths, we experience and live larger and better lives. Lives that are built now on truth and not on misconceptions and misinformation. Now, some of the lies that Dr. Thurman touches on are things like this. You will, you will recognize some of them. Um, th one of the lies is, I have to be perfect. A, a lot of people believe that lie. And, and so they go through life uh, never, and I don't want to spend a lot of time unpacking the lies. I really just plan to list them. But while I'm standing up here, I, I'm starting to think about uh, how they impact the residual impact of these lies. So there are a lot of people, Larry, who never really celebrate who they are. Or watch this, the progress they made because they buy Booker into this lie that I have to be perfect. Now, now I'm going to say this and shut this down. Uh, if, that, if that's the lie you believe in, you are setting yourself up for a horrible, wretched life. Because no matter how hard we try, none of us are ever going to be perfect. So if, if, if that's what you're doing, if, if, if you're running around right now trying to be perfect, you are trying to reach perfection, then I want to release you right now until you exhale, you are never going to be perfect. The, the next lie that, that uh, Thurman list is, now I'm not giving, I just grabbed some out of the book. Uh, the second one is, my unhappiness is someone else's fault. That, that's a lie, that's a lie. You unhappy because you unhappy. <laughs> Hello. You know, I, I would be happy if this person, no, no, no. Chances are you would find another reason to be unhappy. Hello. Your unhappiness is not anyone else's fault but your own. You choose to be happy. Or you choose to be unhappy. I'm trying to see where I can look to get a nod. No, no, you do. You do. And that, and that, that choice is in your power. Now, that doesn't mean folk won't come at you, but you, now watch this, you cannot determine what folk do to you, but you can determine your response to what they do. And I've told you over the years, over this pulpit, to stop giving people veto power over your life. So that you go around sad, sad, soaking, depressed, dreary, and walking around melancholy when you ought to be saying, I'm glad to be alive. God has been good to me. This is a good day. Okay, I'm losing all of y'all right here. Now, you got to make up your mind when you wake up in the morning. This is a good day because a whole lot of folk went to bed last night, didn't wake up. So if you woke Woke up this morning, tell a neighbor you are ahead of the game. So, 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 so your, your happiness or, Joanne, your unhappiness is not someone else's fault. L let me give you the third one and I'll move on. God's love must be earned. <laughs> now, 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 Patrick, that's a, 
That's a lie, boy. No, that's a lie. That's the biggest, boldest, baddest lie. And it's tied back to that perfection thing. Because if I feel God's love has to be earned, then I have to be perfect to be loved. And I don't know how to tell you this, but I hope you receive it. God loves you in perfection and all. Now somebody should have got happier than that. That I just told you the one who made you and the one who knows you and the one who understands you loves you more than anyone else in this world. And watch this. He doesn't love you based on performance. He just loves you because he loves you. God, I wish I had help here. In fact, can I tell you this? If you if you bowled a bowling game of nothing but gutter balls, he still love you. If you played baseball and struck out every time you got to bat, he still love you. If you played uh, basketball and you threw bricks every time you had possession, he would still love you. If you played football like somebody played last night, from Nebraska <laughs> and fumble the ball every time you had it he would still love you and you need to celebrate right now that an almighty God loves you irrespective of what you do God I feel like preaching now tell a neighbor say neighbor I know God loves me now you need to tell the next neighbor, say, neighbor, I know God loves me. Even when I stray, even when I fall, even when I fail, he still loves me. So, so, so Dwight, the lie that I have to be perfect and the lie that my unhappiness or my happiness is someone else's fault and the lie that God's love must be earned are all lies that you and I have believed at one time or another. And there are other lies, aren't there? But I think you start to get the idea. And how many of us grew up hearing these lies, believing these lies, being dominated by these lies, never realizing that they were lies all the time. Now, I mentioned that book, Pastor Kelly, because whatever is wrong with our world today can be traced back to a lie. <laughs> it was a lie that was told, believed, acted on, and watch this, church, all of us are being impacted by that lie right now. Now this week in part two of our series on spiritual warfare, we're looking at what I'm calling the design of spiritual warfare. Everyone say the design of spiritual warfare. Say it one more time. Say the design of spiritual warfare. Now here's what I mean by design. What spiritual warfare? This is Gwen, this is the design of spiritual warfare. What spiritual warfare is meant or intended to accomplish? And beloved, be very sure of this, Ricky. Satan has an end result that he wants to accomplish a means and a method by which he will know he has been victorious in his spiritual battle in our lives. Now we see this truth played out in a powerful way in the Garden of Eden when our first ancestors, Adam and Eve, are attacked by Satan in spiritual warfare. We saw last night that the first aim or desire of spiritual warfare, watch this, is to drive a wedge between us and God. The second design, what we look at this morning, watch this, is that Satan wants to and Satan seeks to deceive us. And Dwight, he does that by telling us lies. Lies that far too often we believe and we fall for. 
So listen to Satan in verse 1 of chapter 3. He says to Eve, has God said, verse 4a, you shall not surely die. Verse 4b, the day you eat of it, you will be like small g gods. Now watch this, beloved. Each of these insinuations come with one purpose in mind, and that is to deceive Adam and Eve. And sad to say, he is still doing the same thing today. So let's look at some of these uh, areas of deception that Satan tries to deceive us in. Here's the first one. Satan seeks to deceive us about our person. Everybody say, my person. Now, if you listen to the words of Satan, they are intended in this text to suggest that as they are, now listen, as they are, Adam and Eve are not good enough that they are lacking or missing out on something. And so the first attack he brings is a lie or deception about their person. Now Satan does this three ways. Here's A. He first of all seeks to deceive us about who we are in our own right. Let me stop right there. Here's what I mean. Satan wants us to walk around with an inferiority complex. Okay, y'all got quiet. That I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I am not worthy enough. I am not good looking enough. Come on, church. The devil is always feeding us. Can I use a big word? Propaganda. He's always whispering in our ear, if you were just three inches taller, if you were just 20 pounds thinner, if you were just one shape, hold on a minute, come here Dwight, I, I've been wanting to do this since last week, uh, l l last week, everybody say lies, lies. no everybody say lies. lies. Last week, I used Dwight in the 10 o'clock service. I was talking about how uh, the devil will use stuff because people you love will tell you things. And I told the story that when I was growing up, uh, and they meant well, they didn't mean nothing by it. They were victims and products of their, of their generation. Uh, the older folk told me, they said, now, now don't y'all laugh. They said, now you dark. See, now I asked y'all not to laugh. They said, now you dark, so when you get married, don't marry nobody dark, so you give your kids a chance. So I brought Dwight up. After service, Tyrone, Dwight came to me. He hugged me. He said, Pastor, he said, can I tell you something? I said, yes, sir. He said, I grew up this color, and I grew up feeling something was wrong with me because I was too light. Now watch this. I'm thinking I'm too dark. He thinking he too light. Thanks, Dwight. So the devil says, watch this. If you were a few shades lighter, darker. Isn't it amazing that no matter who you are, you find something wrong with you? I need some help. I'm preaching good. And the devil will play on your insecurities. God, your, your struggle area. If, if it's your color or your weight or your size or your money or your family, he will play on that and feed propaganda into that to make you doubt yourself. God, I'm preaching good this morning. He seeks to deceive us about who we are in our own right. And watch this, watch this. Dick and Lenny Ubit, if he doesn't do it by giving us inferiority complexes, are y'all ready for this? He'll give you a superiority complex. Have you walking around thinking you the cat's meow? You the Mac Daddy, God's gift to women? That you a prima donna? Come on, talk to me. 
And, and, and how many of you, I know none of you are, but you know people stuck on themselves and thinking they better than everybody else. And that's a delusion and an illusion that is born out of a lie from the devil. So he seeks to attack us about our person who we are in our own right. Here's the next thing. He seeks to deceive us about who we are in our relationship with God. I talked about this last night by the CD because most of the sermon last night centered around this Gwen that he wants to get us to break fellowship with God. He wants to get us to forsake God. He wants to get us to the place where we don't, we don't have faith in who God is and what to lose faith in our relationship with God. Satan does. He tells you, I, 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 know, I know you go to church every Sunday. Watch this. But what has that done for you? Oh, you still got laid off. You're still, you're still not married. Well, look how quiet y'all getting. You still got cancer. So what has serving God done for you lately? And if you don't know how to check the devil. Okay, I can't get no help up here. No, you better learn. In the words of the late A.W. Tozer, you better learn how to talk back to the devil. You stop standing there, sitting there, lying in your bed, letting the devil come in your room and just talk to you nonstop. You better say, hey, time, time out. Let me tell you a thing or two. When I was lost, he found me. When I was down, he raised me. When I was sick, he healed me. When I was broke, he put me back together again. Now, I may be going through something right now, but you can't make me doubt him because I know too much. Okay, I'm through. I'm through. Tell my neighbor, say, I can't doubt him now. He's been too good. He's brought me too far. He's blessed me too much. How do I feel like preaching this? You can't make me doubt him. Oh, no, I feel that. Tell the devil, you can't make me doubt him. Say what you will or may. I know who God is. And I know what God has done for me. Here, see, I got to hurry. He seeks to deceive us about who we are in our own right. He seeks to deceive us, praise team, about who we are in our relationship with God. And then see, he seeks to deceive us about who we are, watch this, in our right to resist and reject him. Now, what do I mean by that? Here's what I mean. See, when you give, I can't remember that, you know, that lady's name. Years and years ago, she was on, um, I can't remember where it was, PTL or 700 Club. A beautiful black lady. She was an older lady. Well, she may not be. She kind of looked like Donna Brazil. She had black and she had gray and black hair. Just a stunning woman. Uh, and she was a female minister. And she wrote a book. This had to be 30, almost 40 years ago now. She wrote this place, this book called Give No Place to the Devil. And, and her point was, you cannot, listen to me, church, you cannot seed, C-E-D-E, -E, seed any ground to the devil. Because, Pastor Kelly, in the words of the old folk raised us, if you give the devil an inch, he's going to take a yard. Which is what, <laughs> he's going to take the whole farm. You, you, you can't give any ground to the devil. Because the moment, listen to me, beloved, I know I'm covering a lot of ground, but you're able to take it. Don't let the devil tell you, I can't get this. He's going too fast. See, that's a lie. You can get this. Because it is imperative that you get it. Because this is a battle you're in, and your enemy doesn't fight fear. So I'm trying to get you equipped for the battle. If you and I give ground, if we seed ground to the devil, watch what he'll do. He'll take the ground we give him and then he'll encroach on what you didn't give him. 
And pretty soon, it's like a, I know none of y'all have done this yet. Some people, well, you haven't because you're too smart. But some people have let a friend live with them. And you say, okay, you can sleep on the couch. And uh, <laughs> next thing you know, they're closing the hall closet. And, <laughs> and the next thing you know, they got stuff in the bathroom. And then they done took over the guest bathroom. And the next thing you know, your whole house is their house. The devil does that. You give the devil a little, say, okay, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to entertain that. Pastor Kelly, he is, so, he is so intentional in his perverseness that he will by stealth come in. And when you look around again, he is running your whole life. Are you in the room with me? And the devil wants to deceive us because watch this. Here's what Adam and Eve didn't understand. They could have stopped this anytime they wanted to. All Eve had to say was, look, I'm not talking to you. Gwen, I'm going to show you why. Because in chapter 2, God had told them, be fruitful, multiply. Watch this, y'all. And have dominion. They had dominion over that serpent. Y'all are not hearing me. They had, Eve and Adam had dominion over that serpent. God, I'm going to say something. And Eve didn't need Adam to tell the devil to shut up. Eve, as a woman, she had the right because God gave her dominion like he gave Adam dominion. She could have shut that door. Veggie, no, she could have shut it down with the quickness. Not to mention Adam standing there with locked jaw. And the devil has deceived us ever since about your right to resist him and reject whatever he brings your way. You and I don't have to just take what the devil's delivering. Are y'all in the room with me? You stop signing for stuff that doesn't belong in your house. Y'all, okay, I'm through, I'm through, I'm through. Somebody bring a package to my house, I didn't order it, I don't sign for it. Come on, y'all, and every day the devil's bringing you negativity, bringing you doubt, bringing you depression, bringing you anxiety, bringing you fear, and you sitting around signing for stuff that God never intended in your house. Would you tell your neighbor, say, clean out your house? Well, let me close. I got to hurry. I'm not going to get you three. Here's a second point. What's the first thing Satan does to deceive us? To deceive us about our... Here's the second one, Herschel. I know you got to preach. Let me get you out of here. Satan seeks to deceive us about our purpose. Now, you know, I miss the purpose. I, I always preach on purpose. Watch this. Verse 4. Listen to verse 4. Satan says, God knows the day you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will become like God, small g. You'll be like him. Now, now, beloved, hear me. Hear me. That sounds good, doesn't it? To be like God. Who doesn't want to be like God? I want to be Christ-like. I want to be God-like. It sounds good. But you got to dig a little deeper. Because while it sounds good, that is not their purpose. And that's not our purpose. Preach, Clark. We are not made to be God. Come on, y'all. No, no, no. That's not your purpose. And when we get confused about our purpose, watch this. We become confused about everything. We, we've, we've seen it. All of us have, don't we? Men who are confused about their purpose. Come on, come on, come on, saints. We all know none of you, brothers, so I ain't talking about none of y'all. But we all know men, Deacon Rosie Dowdy, confused about their purpose. They think they baby-making machines. They, 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 they think their purpose is to, is to put notches on their gun belt by how many women they take down. 
Come on, they think their purpose is pleasure and power and possessions. Y'all getting quiet. And a man who is not clear about his purpose is confused about everything. We've seen children like that, haven't we? Boy, y'all getting quiet. Who think they're the parents? Tell somebody, they really confused. I, 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 I was in Walmart the other day, and I heard a kid talking. I guess that was his mama. He looked like it. it had to be his mama. And he was talking to his mama all out of order. And she was, no, now Johnny, now. I thought to myself, I wish you turn your back and give me Johnny for two minutes. I wish you go to aisle three and stay there about four minutes. You'll have a different Johnny when you come back. Johnny was confused about his purpose. And we haven't only seen men confused about their purpose. Children confused about their purpose. But haven't we seen Ricky leaders confused about their purpose? And when we are confused about our purpose, we get confused about everything. And three things happen. Write these down and I'll go. A, we step out of a, whenever I don't understand my purpose. This is what happens to Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. It's why we have to study it. Because when I'm confused about my purpose, when I allow the devil to deceive me about why I, not remember, a person is who I am. Purpose is why I am. Watch this. I step out of alignment. I'm no longer in alignment. You ever had a car out of alignment? It's going down the road, but it's, it's headed straight, but it's looking like this. Because it's, it's all over the place, Dwight said, because it's out of alignment. See, when you are confused about your purpose, you're not lined up with God's will for your life. Here's the second thing. We step from under authority. That's what Adam and Eve did in chapter 3. They were under the authority of God. They stepped out from under it and got in their own. They made decisions. They're now operating on their authority, not under God's authority. So they're out of alignment and they're from under authority. Here's the third one, C. And we step away from the anointing. And whenever God's, God's anointing, God's unction is not on your life, you got to work twice as hard. Now I'm going to say something, Patrick, and I'm going to leave it alone because I got to go. I know y'all think that it's important that your pastor be anointed, and it is. And I, I strive with everything in me to stay in a place of anointing. And I know you pray for me to be anointed. But here's what I want you to know. While you're praying for me to be anointed on Sunday, eyes be praying for you to be anointed on Monday. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, thank you very much. Thank you very much. But I want you to know back at you. Yeah, you pray me and I'm praying for you because the same anointing that allows me to preach is the same anointing that helps you at the post office. No, no, the same anointing when I'm standing up here is the same anointing when you're standing in, your, in front of your class if you're a school teacher or, if, or with a patient if you're a nurse or you're a doctor or with your colleagues or, with your, or if you're in the field of medicine, if you're a doctor or a nurse, your hands ought to be anointed, your mind ought to be anointed, your mouth, if you're a parent, if you're a spouse, your life ought to be be anointed. Stop thinking because you're not a preacher, you don't need the anointing. The anointing is not just for preachers, it's for every child of God. And when you step away from the anointing, you are on your own. Well, here's the third thing. Satan seeks to deceive us about our, everybody say possessions. Now, one of the tragedies of this experience in the garden is that um, Malvin, Adam and Eve lost everything trying to get what they already had. 
You remember that story? You probably have seen that picture. There are paintings of it. Of a dog with a bone looking into water. And he sees his reflection. So, of course, in the water, the reflection in the water, the bone looks bigger in the mouth of the dog. He doesn't realize he is the dog. And so he's looking at his reflection in the water, sees a dog with what looks like a bigger bone, and he opens his mouth to bark at the dog, to scare the dog, in hopes that the dog will drop the bone. And when he opens his mouth to bark, his bone falls in the water. And he loses what he had, chasing the illusion of what he thought belonged to somebody else. God, I'm preaching. Would you tell her neighbor say, keep your mouth shut? Now, go ahead. They ain't going to hit you in front of me. Tell them, keep your mouth shut. Because you're barking at everybody else trying to get what they have. And you're about to lose what God has already given you. Look, look, look at what Adam and Eve already had. Look at, look at what they had, y'all. Because, because watch this, I'm through. The devil lies. Say the devil lies. He said that if you just go ahead and take a bite, eat it, eat it, eat it. If you eat it, your eyes will be open. You will be like God. You'll know good and evil. Go ahead. And they did it. They bit for the bait. And they lost what they had. And look at what they already had. They already had the fatherhood of God. They already had that. God was their father. He had made them. In his image and after his likeness. They already had, are y'all ready for this? God's DNA in them. And they give up what they have trying to get something the devil tells them they're missing out on. They already have the fatherhood of God. Here's the next thing. They already have fellowship with God. God shows up every day and fellowships with them. God, I'm preaching good. And how many of us today do not appreciate the fellowship we have with God? And so we run around as if I'm missing out. I don't have a date. I don't have a this. I don't have a that. Well, you may not have that, but what do you have? God's fellow. Okay, I'm through. What is greater than fellowship with God? To know that at the end of the day, when the smoke clears and the dust settles, if everybody else walks away, he'll still be there. Okay, y'all, I know because y'all, y'all hating on me. Well, that's easy for you to say because you married. Well, can I speak for married folk? Even married folk need somebody other than their spouse sometimes. And that's where fellowship with God comes in. Because sometimes you need fellowship to, with God to talk about your spouse. I'm through. I'm through. I ain't going to tell y'all how, how I'm sure First Lady's prayer life has gone to another level. Just tell Jesus. Tell him all. <laughs> trials great, trials small. He will bear them, freely share them. Just tell Jesus. Tell him all. Already had fellowship with God. They already had the fatherhood of God. Here's the last word. And they already had the favor of God. Wow. And I'm going to close on this, Pastor Kelly. If you have God's favor, you have everything you need. <laughs> no, 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 you don't believe it. Would you look at a neighbor and say, neighbor, in the words of Bishop Jakes, favor ain't fair. Favor gives you an advantage that you can't get any other way. Uh, you know, uh, on the fifth Sunday, uh, Deacon Dowdy, we're going to be repping schools, repping your school, and we're going to be repping fraternity. So, you know, I know some of y'all belong to, you know, uh, w w where's Deacon Leonard Eubin and, uh, and Minister Hersha Craig? They are proud cappers. <laughs> 
and the cap is run Columbus. I think Amante is a cap. They, they run Columbus. And then we got some proud alphas. And then we got Pastor George, who is a <laughs> proud Sigma. Bless there they are. Look at them. How can two walk together unless they be agreed? <laughs> Cappers and Sigmas walking in together. Some of y'all don't belong to a fraternity. And you don't have anybody you can call to cut you a favor. Because you're not a fat brother. Some of y'all are not deltas. You don't belong to a sorority. You don't belong to the pink and green. You, you don't have nobody to call. So t next, on fifth Sunday, you, go, you probably say, I'm going to stay home. Because I ain't got no school to rep. I don't have no fraternity, sorority to rep. Don't you stay home. You come on out. And I tell you why. You just wear whatever you got. Because if you're a child of God, you belong to Kappa Alpha Favor. <laughs> I'm through, y'all. I got to go. Somebody holler, I belong to Kappa Alpha Favor. I got the favor of God on my life. And he opens doors that have been shut in my face. He makes ways out of no ways. He puts food on my table. He fights my battle. He heals my body. He keeps my mind. He restores my soul. He renews my strength. I have some Somebody holler favor. And don't you give up what you have to get what the devil is offering. Adam and Eve had everything and they lost it all chasing the illusion of a lie. So what lie have you believed? And what lie today do you need to renounce and start stepping in the light? Come on, my time is up. Give God praise. Hallelujah. Kappa neighbor say, tell him, say, Kappa Alpha favor. <laughs> Said our color, our color is blood red. <laughs> Tell them we, it's blood red. Our color is blood red. <laughs> it's red and white. I've been washed in red blood. And I've been made whiter, purer than driven snow. The lies we believe. I have to be perfect. My unhappiness or happiness is someone else's fault. I have to earn God's love. I'm not good enough, smart enough, pretty enough, handsome enough. What lie have you been believing? Because that horrific, horrendous day in the garden took place because of a lie. And our world has been plunged into the abyss of darkness. Because Adam and Eve were deceived about their right to reject and resist what the devil brought to them. And so they listened to the lie. And they lived their lives on the lie. Only thing is they lost everything. They lost what they had trying to get what they didn't need. What lie have you been believing? What has the devil introduced into your mind, your psyche, your spirit that has you at the place where now you're about to give up everything because you're believing the lie? Oh, what lie has crippled you all of your life? What lie? And let me say this. I said it last night. Whatever I'm preaching to you this weekend, no. <sighs> I live with it, deal with it, struggle with it. The devil talks to me like he talks to you and I hate to admit it but many times in my life I listen to the lie and that's why I can preach the way I preach about it because I know it up close so I want you to ask God today to show you 
Is there, is there a lie I've been believing? Because the design of spiritual warfare is to first drive a wedge between you and God. And secondly, it is to deceive you about your person, your purpose, and your true possessions. So bow your head and let's pray. Sing that through a Monte team. Turn.